Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. Motivational consultant, international speaker and author, Amit Vital has empowered people globally with his inspirational guidance and tips for self-development. He provides his audience with the tools needed to achieve personal success, utilize willpower and determination, and develop strategies that will allow people of all ages to achieve personal and professional excellence. After nearly a decade of studying the performance habits of highly achieving athletes, Ahmet has developed programs of inspiration and motivation that are beneficial to individuals, professionals, companies and organisations worldwide. In 2011, Amit published Awaken the Baller Within, which was quickly labelled as the athlete's life manual by some pundits in the sports media. This book was taught in more than a dozen colleges and close to 50 athletic departments and sporting camps. He published his second book, I Am More Than Enough, in April 2019 to address many of his clients' confidence challenges in their personal and professional life. This is the Strong, Single and Human podcast. Hi. Aman Vital, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you for coming and joining us. Now, look, um, I've given a brief synopsis about who you are, etc. But like what I'm fascinated to find out is like, how did you become a motivational speaker? Like, there's lots of things that you could have done, right? But why did you pick that one? Well, you know, I, I've, I've been a writer my whole life and basically a journalist. And when I wrote my first book, Awaken the Bottle Within in 2011, I remember at the time I was speaking at a spiritual experience with a mentor of mine at that time. And, you know, I'm, I'm opening up the service. I'm doing a, a few talks here and there. And of course, my book had came out. And then he and another colleague of mine was like, you know, if you want to learn, if you want to sell books, you should go speak. And I was like, OK, I'll try that out. And my first client bought 80 copies of my book. And I said, you know, coach, since you bought 80 copies, I'll come by and speak to your group. And spoke to one. And next thing you know, another uh, sports team, another uh, football team did the same. And it just started being a trickle-down effect. And I started getting the camps and get your first, first company. And it just sort of just came from there. And you just learn along the way. And then next thing you know, it's like, hey, maybe, maybe I can do this. And, you know, we're 12 years in now, so... It's good times, exciting times. And it's like a waterfall of events, isn't it, really, that meant that you were supposed to be where you are now? Yes, and and, and it's interesting. Obviously, I started off more in the motivational lane, and I'm still there today, but, you know, get a couple of speaker coaches and says, you know, you can do some seminars, and then you can dive in deeper because the keynote only allows you to just scratch the surface, and you can dig deeper with a seminar, and then – you know, you do two and three day conferences and, and it, it just God. more and more and more. Then it's like, you know, teaching curriculum and it just it, it's 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 evolved so much over time. But I, I'm excited to see where it goes. I love teaching. I love speaking, but I also love teaching um, as well, because you can take bigger concepts and break them down and they can walk away with some real deeper takeaways other than as a keynote. It's just a couple of flashpoints uh, of some strategies you can do. But you get to like work them through in a seminar and long form setting. And so I I don't really have a preference on which one, uh, which one I do because I'm going to come up with the same energy either way. It's just a matter of, am I going four hours or am I going 90 minutes? So either way it works out. for me. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And this all started with you publishing your book, your first book. Yeah. It did. Yes. Which is, which is called awaken the baller within. I don't know, cool. like, so, and I, so let's just explain what a baller is, right? Because I see a baller in my Englishness as somebody, we would call a baller as somebody who cries all the time, right? 
we didn't want to awaken that person, right? Because that's what we'd call a baller, right? However, you wouldn't refer to a baller as somebody who cries all the time, like who balls and cries. That's what we would actually call them, right? So what is a baller? So in the West, um, uh, obviously, a ball, uh, taking really the, the verb of, of, of bawling. You yeah, know, crying, of bawling, and, crying. And that's, that's, yeah. And, that's, and that would be that. And, 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 and you're not wrong. Uh, there, there's many ways. In the West, baller can, can go down a couple of different paths. Obviously, if you play sports, especially one that requires a ball, yeah. uh, typically baller usually goes more for football and basketball. But I guess it could work with soccer. Uh, or what you all would call football uh, yeah. in other parts well, of the world, because uh, we're the only ones. We're the only ones who use football in the way. No, and that's why no, I football because, American. no, because I'm in Australia, right? So I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and we call football what I would know as football in the UK as soccer here, because we've got AFL here, which is Aussie football, which is the Aussie Football League or Aussie Rules, right? So. We've got a different type of football to what you have. And I need to get in on that. So, oh. I mean, whatever you need to do, um, I, I need to experience the Aussie football. Oh, my uh, so God, I come over. Come you here. won't make head nor tail of it. You'll go, what the <laughs> hell is this? Why are all these I'm, people I'm running around? But, I'm yeah. here for it. I'm here for it. I, and I'm, yeah. I'm sure that the shorts are, are very to where you to see all oh the attributes, all the all oh, the, well, I'm not, the sweat and muscles. And, uh, I'm and not uh, sure. uh, my my complaint is I go Aussie rules has three goals, not one goal. What is that about? So if you miss the middle goal, you still get a point. Well, we don't have that in soccer. So. Well, I do guess you, you, have just that, you don't have that. You don't have that in American football, though, do you? You have one goal as well. We have one goal, but there's multiple ways to score. Um, oh, you know, God. touchdowns, extra points. You can kick for points. I mean, it's a lot of it's a lot of things. But I see I need to come down to Australia uh, for a couple of extra days so I can just study the rules. Um, oh. So I can just sit down with some of the coaches and and, and figure those things out. But as sort far as I sort as I baller has many meanings in the West and okay. some of them are not as positive as others. Obviously if you play football and you're good at what you do, you know, it's like, man, he's a baller. You know, if you can hoop, play basketball, okay. you're a baller, but there's also a baller of the streets as well. Um, and we might as well just go ahead and educate your, your audience on, on all forms of ballers. So somebody who maybe makes money in a, uh, in a nefarious way, um, a way that can possibly get them put in jail sometimes is known oh. as a baller as well. Like he's, he's balling. He has a lot of money and how he makes his money. Um, oh you know, my you're, God, you're really? I never, wow. Yes. See also another phrase that we would use is he's got the balls, right? He's got some balls to do. So I wondered if that was, look at all these things, all these meanings, but it's great. So your book is Awaken the Baller Within, right? So this is Awaken the, this is not Awaken the Criminal. This is Awaken no, somebody awaken. who is, yeah. is um <laughs> has got the sport. kahunis to move forward. <laughs> it's, it's using sports, primarily football, as a metaphor for life. Of course, the, the way I sign all of my books with when it comes to Awaken the Baller Within was keep showing up on the field of life. We're all ballers on the field of life, meaning what? Okay, so maybe you don't play football, maybe you don't play basketball, maybe you don't play sports at all, but there is an arena you go into, whether it's the office, whether it's the farm field, whether it's you as a police officer, whether you're a teacher in the classroom, whether you're a lawyer in the courtroom, like we're all ballers playing a game of life. And our goal is to become as proficient in what we do to be able to do that. Now. Obviously, I'm writing this at the time for football players because I was a young man who played sports since the age of 10. And so I wanted to write something for young men to be able to have as a reference to be better on the field and off the field. So I'm using sports language. I'm using sports references. Yeah. I'm using sports analogies to carry over because when I say keep showing up on the field of life, I want you to be exceptional on the field. But the mindset it takes for you to be successful on the field is going to take you to, to the place off the field because all of the guys I studied for this, uh, probably about a third of them made it to the NFL, the National Football League, professional wow. sports. 
And but the deal is, is most of them. And yeah, almost all of them are no longer playing sports. But shocker, they are successful in their lives. They're successful family men. They're entrepreneurs. I have a, a, a project manager, a guy who owns a construction company, waste managing my company. I got a couple of engineers. I have a Hollywood actor. I have my goodness. I'm, I was just running down. I got another guy who's going into cybersecurity. I have a young man. He's 24 years old and he's buying his third house. So wow. he's doing well in life. Right. And so when, when I say keep showing up on the field of life is continue to improve and advance your skills on and off the field, because I've known a lot of guys who were talented. They can jump fast, run, run. They can run fast, jump high, catch all the passes, make all the plays. But if you don't have the mindset to go with it, that talent ends up getting wasted because you can't keep your mental faculties in place to be able to utilize the skills you have. I like to call them talents and casualties because what ends up happening is they have all these abilities, but they don't have the mental framework to keep everything in line, to control their emotions, to, to get themselves focused on a particular goal, right? Because, and I'm sure we'll get on this a little bit later, but all yeah. of my guys were very altruistic in their approach. It was, even though they're the top guys, they're the, they're the best of the best, top 100 players in the entire country, in the entire United States, these guys were concerned about team success more than their own. And those are qualities that you take into life. Leadership, yeah. patience, pragmatic, stoic, um, delayed gratification. You know, all of the things that society is telling us not to do anymore because it's like, it's all about me. Live your best life, you know, all this stuff. And it's like, no, we're at our best when we're serving others, not being self-serving. And so that's what Awaken the Baller Within is. It takes the mindset that it takes to be successful on the field. I want you to be successful there, but I want it to carry over off the field when you're in the classroom, when you're in the workplace, you're on the street, you're dealing with your friends, you're at your church and different places like that. So that's where the correlation between being a baller on the field of life ties in with Awaken the Baller Within. Right. Okay. And like what, what made you actually, because putting pen to paper is a major like, achievement right because it's not easy to actually write a book buddy I have to say um and you're now on your second book as well right so like well I say you've published your second book right so and that one is I am more than enough right which is a whole podcast episode on its own right but like <laughs> what made you actually go to write a book right because like yeah you could do the talking and I must admit I prefer doing podcasts and talking to actually putting pen to paper. But like, what made you do that? Well, I'm actually the opposite. I've been writing since the age of 10. I always jokingly say I learned how to walk and then I picked up a pen and started writing. I have notebooks and journals all around me. At the core, I'm a writer. Uh, speaking is secondary because everything I do, you listed off consulting, you listed off curriculum building, you listed off speaker, you listed off coach, you listed off consulting, you listed yeah. off ministry all of it starts with a pen and pad for me i've been making notes while we've been on this conversation right now because all, all i do is write that's god's gift to me to be able to pick a pen up and write all day that's what that's literally what most of my time goes to so if it was up to me if i could snap my fingers and have the idea of life i would literally sit here with 97 composition books and write books all day. I would put out 10 books a year probably if I oh if I if, if if it if it was just like okay, I just all my needs are met financially and all it, all I'm all I'm contracted to do is write books, I would do that all day. I would travel, write, speak, teach, come back and rinse, wash and repeat. So for me, writing is like breathing. I, you know, take care it's of my easy. morning. It, it's 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 it literally is a calling and a gift for me. It's not even it's not even a strain. Like, I mean, I get mocked all the time because I still carry a, a physical planner. I don't I don't use the I don't use the you the, don't use the computer, app. the handheld I mean, computer. So I, I like the mental aspect of writing. Even when I write my books, they start off on a pad and then I wow. transform to the computer. Now, once I get it into the computer and I'm getting my flow going, I will type into that and let that roll. But when I want pure unadulterated, unfiltered, raw thoughts. I'm taking a composition book and I'm going to the park 
I'm sitting outside on my porch. I'm sitting on a beach. I'm sitting on a balcony somewhere overlooking beautiful mountains. And I'm allowing God to speak to me and put it pen to pad and see what comes out of it. And then we sift it all out later. That's who I am when it comes to writing. So I would, I prefer, I prefer writing over pretty much every other medium I do. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. Well, and I can hear that in your voice. So, you know, um, yeah, no, mine is, mine is talking, but that's why I'm doing this. So look, okay. So let's go into, um, into a few of the things that you've written about. Okay. Like how do we, how do we awaken the baller as it were? I don't know if I can pronounce that very well, but like you're doing, you're doing great. You're doing awesome. <laughs> it seems to get stuck just as it comes out before my teeth. Um, but how do we awaken the baller then? How do we like, how do we get motivated? How do we live our best life away yeah. from the football pitch? What do we do? Because this is what I'm trying to instill in my child, right? As a single parent, right? I don't want to look after this kid for the rest of his life, right? He needs to go out there and awaken his own baller. Well, well, you know, that's that's definitely a conversation we're going to have offline um, because I specialize in those, those things. But main thing is that you have to work up on purpose with purpose. Um, a lot of times the reason why we're unmotivated is because we just get up and just say it's whatever. And unfortunately, whether you're in Australia, you're in the United States, you're in Texas, you're in, you know, Germany, it doesn't matter. We, society has taught young people to just get up and just live their best life, but they don't tell them what the heck that looks like. They have no purpose. It's just get up and do stuff, do what makes you happy. You don't know what makes you happy if you don't have a purpose, right? How do we and find if, that purpose? How do we, how do you find it? You sit still. You oh, okay. read, you pray, and, and you and you and you open yourself up. And I always say, pay attention to what you do that takes requires no motivation. Okay. Like take personal inventory of yourself. Everybody has a gift. They just haven't discovered what it is yet. They need to look, they need to, to really seek out the time, journaling, sitting time being still, and just deciding what it is. And somebody like, well, my kid, all he does is sit around and play video games. I know people who make millions doing things with video games, right? And there's a skill that goes along with that. Maybe you like to write. Maybe you like to act. Maybe you like to do poetry. Maybe you like to build things. There's a, there's a lane in the open and free market. There's a lane for everything. It's just most people don't sit down long enough to be like, hey, what moves me? Because there's, 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 a, there's a difference between passion and what gets you paid. And sometimes there's an intersect between the two. You know, because obviously I get paid to write, but that's not where my primary money comes from. But it is something where my money does come from. But most of the times we are not taught how to think. We're taught what to think. Yeah, right. And I agree. That's, that's what's wrong with the public school system. Yeah. We have to sit down with ourselves and identify where our strengths are. What do we do when nobody has to push us? Like, you know. Your kid right now, I don't know what he likes to do, but I guarantee you there's something he does that you don't have to push him to do. And there's something he does that you don't have to push him to do that's constructive. And he doesn't know that there's somewhere in the market he can utilize that skill. He just hasn't figured that out yet. We just have to sift through it. You know, that's where the journaling comes in. We know, what are you doing with your day, right? And so once we can identify that, then now we can put together some goals. Okay, if you can have it your way, what do you want? What do you want out of life? And you can do this at like the age of 12. And, and it's and it's it's sort of simple and it might be kind of wild, but when you sift through all of the little pieces or whatever, there's a gem in there, right? You, and you can do that when you start opening up, pulling out a pen and pad and journaling and finding out like, what do you want to accomplish this week, this month, this quarter, this year? And then you start looking through all of those and you pick out, what it is. Cause I mean, if you're dealing with somebody who's 10, 11, 12 years old, obviously they're going to have some goofy stuff on there, but if they put I down 10 you have goofy stuff as an adult, you haven't seen my lists, but yeah, you're making, you're making my point for me. Yeah. And that's, that's exactly where we are. 
Like we have to take some of those wild things and be like, that's pretty crazy. But you know what? I know somebody who does this, This is very similar to this. Oh, really? And now we have something to work with. Because once we have the big goal, or as one of my uh, mentors says, the big kahuna goal, then we start chipping that thing away and said, okay, what is that? How long do we think that that would take to get? Is that a three-year plan or a two-year plan? Okay, then we start working in reverse. Okay, what, what resources do we need to do that? Is there some schooling we need? Is there some funding we need? Is there someone who's already doing that? How about I reach out to them and become an apprentice of them? How about I send an email to them and say, hey, can I have a seven minute conversation on how you're doing what you do? I'll be done in seven minutes. I learned that from another one of my mentors too. The oh, most, the most successful the most successful people are the most available people because you think, oh, I can't get in touch with, you know, Brendan Bruchard, Jack Canfield, Tony Robbins. I can't get in touch with them. Social media made it where you can almost get in touch with anybody. But, but also said, there's no such word as can't, is there? Like if you say to yourself, I can't get in touch with them, how do you know? Because you've not tried. You've got to try. Well, just shoot, well you got to shoot your shot too. Yeah. Let's just, let's, let's just say maybe you can't get to that guy. Well, he's not the only one. She's not yeah. the only one who does it. Try someone else. And next thing you know, and, and again, you never know. There was... There, there's a man who has written, I think he's written 37 books. And I found him on Instagram and he, he was running a conference, a conference I absolutely loved. And I was like, there's no way I'll ever be able to afford it because it was like the conference. And at the time I was broke <laughs> and I think it was like five grand to go to. And I'm like, oh my that's God. my whole marketing budget. I can't get there. And I remember I sent him an email one day and I said, Hey, um, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to interview you and ask you three or four questions. Are you available? 45 minutes later, he sent me a message back. Like, yeah, yeah, call me here. Why? But if you didn't ask, you wouldn't have got. Shoot your shot. Yeah. Shoot your shot. What's the worst that can happen? They tell you no. If you don't ask, the answer is always no. Exactly. And so, as, as I you, like as that. You saying, as you were saying, as you're unpacking these things, see how we just generated ideas just between yeah. us right now? Now for that lost soul out there who's figuring out what's my next step, just get to talking with people, get to writing things down, get your mind moving, and then maybe you can get off that couch and stop eating Cheetos and let's get to moving on something that's productive. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree, I agree. So I want to delve into something else that you said because you you said it as a comment, but I find that people in in my work environment uh, and in my personal life and stuff that um, it's so hard to attain, right? You said something about emotional intelligence and actually being connected and in control of your emotions. And I think you said you you there was something in the Awaken the Baller within that was about controlling emotions, right? And actually being in control of who you are because – there are so many um, people that you had had experience of in your life that basically um, were so good at all these other things, but just there were key things that they weren't in control of. And one of them being emotional intelligence and things like that. Right. Like how do, how do we, how do you get people to actually focus on what they're feeling? Cause coming from the, coming from where you're coming from, which is like an athlete, sports environment right I don't see many of the guys within those environments focusing on how they're feeling taking a step back taking a deep breath and like focusing on the emotions as such or am I wrong I don't know well and that's where that's where sitting that's where I believe sitting still and for me obviously I'm somebody who prays daily multiple Mm. times a day which that in and of itself is a game changer altogether. You know, I, I am obviously someone who's a huge proponent of religious, uh, uh, of religion. Obviously I represent Christ, as you can see behind me with the the cross behind me. And and so I, I, I represent the Christian faith and it has been, my success is largely tied to that because I've tried it without that. And you see success for up, up to a certain time and then you crash and burn because you realize that, your life is bigger than the existence you represent here on earth. There has to be something larger than just your ego, your money, your status, your fame, all of this stuff is fleeting and all of this stuff goes away. And so I, 
like to make sure that I'm grounded and understanding that this life I have is bigger than me and it's not about me. It's about the service I provide. It's about the community. It's about who, whose life am I making better by the services I provide. And can I help enough people get what they want, which in part, you know, with the way my faith is structured, you, you get back to you the blessings from when you bless others. Yeah. And so that is a foundational truth for me. Um, some people, some people meditate, some people um, sit still, some people and call it visioning or whatever, just stuff like that. Obviously I have my way yeah. of doing things. The, 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 the main thing is, is that when we talk about the purpose, when we talk about having something you're going for, because obviously making decisions based on emotions is very dangerous. And when we know this, yes. right? If you make decisions based on emotions, you're probably going to end up in a ditch. It, it just is because, and that's where saying you have an objective, you have a goal, you have a target you're going for. And it's the whole thing was like, well, I'm scared. Yeah. Do it scared. I'm feeling some type of way you do it anyway. I mean, once we become adults, which most of the people on this podcast are adults, yeah. um, we don't have the luxury of, I don't feel like it. Right. There's no. things that need to be done. And so regardless of what you're feeling like, and I mean, some days are going to be better or worse than others. That's called life. We have to go get things done. And whether we're afraid, we're, we're, we're scared, whether we're, we're sick, whether we're tired, whether we're sad, whether we're excited, it doesn't matter. We need to have an even-minded way of going about our business to be able to achieve what needs to be done. I'm not saying you have to completely shelve your emotions. I'm saying you need to do what needs to be done in, in regardless of your emotions. Yeah. We have to push through. We have to make these things happen. We have to get stuff done. We don't have the luxury of, well, you know, I'm just, I'm just not feeling it. That's human nature. We're going to have to go through those things, but we have to continue to do it because our emotions, as, as, as my youth pastor said recently, your emotions are always going to lie to you. Why? Yeah. You can't rely on them. You can't rely on them all the time because they're, it's like a boat just stirring. It's just going back and forth. And it's just like, there's got to be an even, there's got to be an even kill an even playing field that you have to regulate on your own. I'm feeling sad today, but I have a project that needs to be done. All right. Let me sit over here, wipe my tears off, take a couple of deep breaths, Pray, sit still, whatever you need to do, and then go attack life vigorously and go get stuff done. And I know people are like, oh, well, you don't understand. I, I. It's not about that. It's about understanding what needs to be done. And if it's a priority enough for you, then you need to go ahead and do that in spite of what you're feeling. And yes, the feelings are real. But we still have objectives and things that need to be done because otherwise we will not be productive human beings if every time our emotions are somewhere and they're not properly put in check, we can't get anything accomplished in life. So is that what you're saying? So is that how we stay motivated by actually still looking at the end goal and working towards that end goal? And um because it's so easy the first few days to <laughs> um be motivated and go, yeah, I've got this goal and it's great. But then when you get through to like, you've been doing it for a couple of weeks and you go, oh, maybe just one day I won't do X or whatever. And then it goes into two days and three days and then you lose all motivation and that's it, right? So is that how you stay motivated is to just keep focusing on that goal, just keep reassessing, taking a deep breath? Yes, that and really questioning yourself and asking yourself the hard question. How much do I really want this? Okay. Because if you think, if you think about it, if you think about it, how much motivation do you need every morning to go do your bathroom duties, brush your teeth and shower? How much motivation do you need to do that? Not much. Thank but you. is that a habit? But is that a habit, right? Cause do I want to okay. be Yes. Unclean and, and, and grubby and, and, and like you, and you wanting to achieve what you need to do needs to be needs to have that same vigor and, and excitement to go ahead and get it done with a, with with proper habits. You say you know motivation falls off. Okay, so how bad do you do you truly want this? Do you truly want the promotion? 
Do you truly want to finish writing your book? Do you truly want to find the, the love of your life? Do you truly want to be able to earn enough to buy a house, right? If you know that you need to save 10K per month for three years to be able to buy a house, and you're just like, oh man, I, I really just don't feel like it this month. Do you want the house or not? Well, exactly. Do you want to write the book or do, do you want the book or not? Do you want do you want to live a life with someone who you're in a loving relationship and build a family with or not? You have to really take a take a quick or take a hard look at what your values are and what you say you truly want. Right. And I'm and I'm not talking to your people. I'm talking to myself, too, because there's a couple of goals that are on the shelf. And it's just like, dude, do you want this? Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Do you Me really too. want this? Me too. Do you truly want it? Because if you truly wanted it, there would be nothing that would stop you. Because I can tell you right now, if something, if one of your family members was just like, hey, there's something dangerous going on and I need help right now. You will stop this podcast right now, jump in your car and get over there to go see them because that's urgent. Why don't we treat our goals with the same level of urgency? Well, and also they're important, right? So they're important to us. So your goals should be important. There should be a why to your goal, shouldn't there? Absolutely. And it should it be important to, tied, to it you. Tied, it needs to be tied to something that's like, I always like the burn the ships moment in, back in the day when it's like, hey, we're going to pull up to this land. We're going into war. We're burning the ships. Meaning if we don't come out on top, it's over. Wow. Right? And yes, some I things, thought of and that. Some things in life, if some things in life, you need to treat that way. Yeah. It just, it just, it just is that. You know, I mean, and people are like, oh, man, that's, you know, that's a little bit too, that's too aggressive. That's too, well, okay. That two year goal turns into 10. Did you want it? Do you want it? How long are you going to prolong uh, what you want out of life? And you'll decide how important it is, how high it is up your value chart every day when you wake up. Do you almost obsess over it, over getting it done? Right? I remember, I remember when I was first writing Awaken the Bottle Within, I wrote the first, I wrote the first chapter in like four days. Wow. And then it took me a couple of months to write the next three, only to go back and read the first chapter and say, who the heck wrote this? This is nonsense. And I scrapped it all over again and started over because if you don't get on a rhythm, you'll look back at that when you're going through the editing process and say, this is garbage. Who wrote this? And it's you. Oh my so God. you got to keep the fire burning because you got to remember, you're growing every day. A, a new player shows up every day. You don't, re you are not the same woman you were a week ago. You, I mean, nice. you're you, so you're just like, you don't think about it. But when you really start putting pen to pad and start doing little things it's like, wait a minute, I used to have trouble with this. Now it's just a breeze. Now take that same growth every week, every day, every month and apply it to something that you want to get done. The book, uh, more resources, launching a podcast, whatever that is for you, when you can take those little traits that you're already doing and you don't realize it, you take that same value system and plug it in over here. And now we got something we're working with where you say, you know what? Every day I'm committed to two hours of my book. Period. End of story. That's how I am with fitness. Right. Yeah. Some days I'm like, I don't, I don't have a lot of time. And it's like, can I go get 30 minutes in? Can I go get 17 minutes in? I got to just get my blood flow, anything, anything. Like, man, I'm looking down at my clock and I say, okay, I have an appointment in 35 minutes. I can go run two miles and get back in shower in time for a podcast or get oh better my back God. In an interview, in a, for an interview because it means that much to me. Yeah. Now, lo and behold, if I could take that same thing into building my fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh line of income in my business, we'd be rocking out on a whole nother level. But yeah. I, I, I see it from the standpoint of you see where the motivation is, is where when you start getting it into habits and yes. you start building habits, those goals, you start looking at them every day. Like if I flip my camera around, there's, there's seven goals there's 21 goals, but there's seven areas of life of goals that are on my thing. So every time I'm here working in my in my office, there is physical, spiritual, financial, social, business, mental, and family goals sitting right across from me. And I look at them every day and it's like, 
Are you on top of this? Yes or no? Why are you not? Why have you not done number two on your spiritual goals? Have you reached your goal for financial? Because I think you're about, I think you're about 10 grand off on that. I think we need to get back into gear. Have you created another line of income? Have you created um, a new keynote to offer to your people? Have you read your fourth book this year, this year? Have you, you know, contacted your family uh, on a weekly basis to check in on them? All these goals are sitting right here next to me that I see every day. Oh my God. And so when you have that going, it, it becomes an accountability thing. And what are you accountable to yourself? And then you surround people who can hold you accountable for what you say you want to be held accountable for. Yeah. And so with that, get the yes people out of your life. Get people who think everything you do is awesome out of your life. Get people who will look at you and say, um, you're not living up to the values you said you put on this paper over here that you shared with yeah. me on January 2nd of this year. Where are we on goal number five? Are, have, you, have you done this yet? Because I've not gotten an update on it. Yeah. All these things, all these things keep that fire burning. People start that challenge you. Yes. You got it. it Support you as well. Support Ch you as well. You. Yes. Yes. But they need to be able to check you too. And you need to be able to accept that. Because, yeah. because it can't be just all gumdrops and rainbows. It can't be patting you on the head and say, you're just so awesome. I loved everything you've done. No, somewhere you're falling short and somebody needs to be able to properly tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. And tell no, you that's... you're out of line. Tell you you're tell you you're missing the mark. You but, need that. Okay. But then if if somebody's telling you you're out of line, right? Like it's quite easy to get pissed off with them and tell them, well, I've had other things to do. So how do you take on board that criticism? Let's call it criticism, right? How do you take on criticism and turn it into a positive? Get over yourself. That's number one. Okay. <laughs> Check yourself. It's like, it's like I I get into it with my manager all the time because we're like, we're, we're hot and cold. Like I'm just boom, boom, boom. And he's like, hey man, maybe you should do this, this, this. And I'm like, man, I ain't really, I'm not really talking about doing that. And then after a while, I'm just like, you know what? He's right. Yeah. <sighs> You're right, man. So, so what do we need to do? How do we need to resolve this or whatever? Yeah, you can get pissed off. In fact, that might be what you need. Okay. You need somebody to probably come in and light a fire up under you because you've had too many yes people telling you you're so awesome, which means you're not growing, which means you're stagnant, which means you're getting lesser every day because you don't have the right people in your life to tell you when you are falling short of the intended goal of where you're going. I don't care about pissing people off at all, whether they're my teenagers, whether they're family, whether they're clients, it doesn't matter. In fact, you're welcome. That's where it goes. Well, no. That's... I, 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 I appreciate you letting me know you're pissed off. At least I got a rise out of you. You know what the worst thing you could be is indifferent. Well, The worst yes. thing you could do is be indifferent. Like you don't care either way. That's the worst. At least if you're upset, you're upset enough to, to know that something's not right. And if you're downtrodden, then that means you, you're feeling bad about something. But at least it's a high and a low. We can work with that. But when you're just like, uh, eh, laissez-faire, sit on the couch, you know, and do nothing and go get another round of Starbucks that you can't afford, then yeah. we don't have anything to work with. No. So it's, it's okay. It's okay to get pissed off. In what? fact. No, go on. In fact, what? In fact. It might not be a bad thing. We got a rise out of you. Yeah, that's right. Got some emotion out of somebody. What about if you're already... And, and like like you say, right, you've dealt with a lot, a lot of colleges, a lot of athletes, um, a lot of successful people, right? Um, what about if you become successful, you've reached your goal as such, what happens then? Like, how do you keep motivated? So you reach your goal, whatever that may be, I don't know, win a World Cup because we've had the Women's World Cup here, right? So Spain, right? God love them. Spain have won the Women's World Cup and they reach their pinnacle, right? How do you, what do you do then, right? Because how do you keep motivated then? How do you keep going forward then? You notice the successful people 
tend to keep working. Yeah. Because because that's yeah, just the thing. set another goal. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. So simple. I mean, Warren Warren Buffett. He's he's the top five richest guy, definitely in this country, possibly in the world. Oh, he yeah. still works six hours a day. He's I know, and how like old is he? He's like, like 105. 80, 80, he's like 86. He still gets up and reads stock reports. Um, I think he said he puts in four to six hours a day. I think he's worth, what, $109 billion? Oh, my God. And he still works his ass off. All the guys on Shark Tank, they're all worth tons of money. They still show up to work every day. Billionaires still go to work every day. But Why? I think you, I think you knocked, I think you hit the nail on the head, right? It's about doing something that you enjoy, I think. And I think Warren Buffett enjoys what he does. You're serving. Well, yeah. Remember, remember the, remember the, remember the money is just the end result of providing a good and service to enough people that brings you the return. Yeah. It's the service. It's the it's the service. It's the goods. It's the it's the advice. It's the it's the it's the serving the needs of others. It's fair exchange. Yeah. And it's just they fared exchange to where it turned into billions. Yeah. Some it turns into millions. Some people are still trying to make their first forty thousand. Yeah. Right. But you love what you do, or you love the idea of serving in a certain way. Like I love doing ministry work. Right? Yeah. I love doing ministry work. Ministry work does not put, does not directly put money into my no. pocket. It doesn't. However, ministry work gives me the fulfillment to know that I'm following God's plan and I'm blessed in other areas of my life because I'm investing in our future, in the youth and doing that work. And in, and in part, I'm giving back because what, what is service? What, what, is, what is ministry? When you do work for nonprofits, you do work for churches and things of that nature. When you give, you are telling God, I'm grateful for what you've provided me for. So how does this work? Let's just say you made your first $40,000. Let's just throw a number out there just so I can so you can do that and just say, "You know what, God, I'm so grateful for this $40,000. I'm going to tithe my 10%. I'm going to give back to nonprofits. I'm going to serve in my church. I'm going to tithe in my church. I'm going to be on missionary groups. I'm going to do all of these things. You have given me more than enough to be able to take care of my needs and the needs of others." And it's like, "Hmm, well, you've been so grateful and blessed with 40. How about I double you? And now you got, and so it, it, it turns into this where you keep working toward, you keep getting more blessings and opportunities to give more because you keep giving more. If that makes sense. You keep yeah. giving. A lot of people say, I'll give more when I get more, but you can't get more until you give from where you are. And people miss that. People say, when I get rich, I'm going to give, I'm going to give a lot of money. No, you give from where you are. You give yeah. the shirt off your back. You give from what you already possess. And what does that mean? Because how much money is enough for you to then give, right? Because like. And, and, it's not, and, and, and it's not just about the money. You have a talent. You have a talent in podcasting. So. Some may say not, but. Thanks. <laughs> well, what I'm saying, like, yeah, let's just, I know. Hey, let's, just say, let's just say you went to a community center out there in, in Australia and there's a bunch of, you know, high school and, and early graduates who, who are showing up out there and they're just excited about podcasts. And then let's just say three hours a month, you went to this community center and taught the basics of podcasting and you charge nothing. You just want to give back to the community. That is you tithing your time and your skills for the next generation. It's not actually money coming out of your mouth, even though it time is money. So I do understand that, but it's not you yeah. actually giving money. It's you tithing your skills, timing your time, tithing your profession, tithing what you do back to the community. That's you giving back and pouring into others. Now, what ends up happening? Let's just say you touch one of those people and they end up becoming the next Joe Rogan. They end up becoming the next major podcaster. They end up becoming a Les Brown, a Jack Canfield or whatever. 
that's a beautiful thing. You can sit back and say, man, I'm grateful we created this. And that person might be like, you know what? There was somebody 15 years ago who poured into me and gave me my first uh, lesson in podcasting. See, this is how giving works, right? Technically, to whom you pour into, the blessing won't come from them. It may come years later through some other means, but it always comes back. And so that is something that really fuels my daily task, right? Is the idea of not what can I give, but whom can I serve? It's, can, it's just, it's so, it's sorry, carry on. No, 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 you're good, go ahead. No, 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 because I want to delve into this second book that you produced right as well, right? So it's, is this why you wrote the second book, I'm More Than Enough? Is this, were you trying to give some positive shimoles for want of a better word because I haven't got one were you were you trying to tell people that they are more than enough and that they were you giving to your community what was what was why did you write the second book the second book was because I had a total and epic meltdown because I lost my father the night after my 33rd birthday wow and he had been retired for three, four, five years up to that point. And he was my moral barometer. You know, I have two fathers. I have a biological father who's still alive. And the man who raised me um, died the night after my 33rd birthday. Yeah. And so whenever I had, and I was just coming up in business, I had just bought a home. Like I was living the American dream during that time. And he was the guy I could always call on when I was in a moral dilemma. Yeah. Hey, what is the right thing to do here? And he always had an answer and he always answered the phone. So I could always lean on that. Yeah. Well, out of nowhere, there was no heads up. There was no uh -huh. things are bad. It's just like your father's dying. And five hours later, it was true. Wow. He, like Just like that. And I remember the conversation. I more than enough came from a conversation with God when I went to the hospital and I'm pissed off. Like yeah. I'm talking really pissed off because I'm just like, how can you do this to me? You took away the one moral barometer, the person who yeah. kept me in line, the person who poured into me, the person who has given me what it takes for me to be in the position I am. I was a, I was a national sports writer. Um, I was, you know, writing for three or four different magazines. I was, you know, going to different stadiums across, across the state, covering all of these high-end athletes, making very good money doing this and was on top of the world, American dream, nice house, nice car. I was engaged. Everything in life was going well. And then boom, the night of my 33rd birthday, my father's gone. Wow. And I remember screaming at God outside in the parking lot while I'm crying and everything. And then God spoke to me in the parking lot and was like, you are asking for your father to walk out of here. But I'm telling you that he is walking out of here in the embodiment of you. Yeah. I've given you everything you need. He's giving you everything you need. The work ethic, the morals, the, the integrity, all of these different things. Now, why don't you go out there and become what your heavenly father and your earthly father is calling you to be? You have everything you need. You are always more than enough. And I wrote, and I wrote the book and I wrote, and I wrote that book a year later. I am more than enough. And it, it all came from that conversation with God in the parking lot of a hospital. And so I break down how when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And if you don't see a capable, loving winner who can make things happen in their life, then we need to then we need to, to go through some programming to get you to under, to under, to to find out why. At what point did someone convince you you're not a winner? At yeah. what point did someone tell you you're not enough? At what point did someone tell you you're not deserving, uh, you're not able to be loved, that you're not in a position to go out and earn for yourself, to make a great life for yourself? When did someone have, when did someone tell you that? You know, and why did like you a, believe him? Then that too, that too. Why it's almost like an him? moment when, when Adam hid from God and was like, you know, I was naked and afraid. He was like, who told you you were naked? What are you afraid of? There was, I create, I just created all, like, what could you possibly be afraid? What, what, first of all, when did the idea of being afraid even show up? Well, yeah. What did you do to where you decided that you were afraid 
of your father. When did you decide that you're going to wake up and think that you're a loser, that yeah. you're not capable? And so I'm more than enough unpacks all the nonsense to where you can look and say, okay, I do have some value. I do have some worth. Now, it's not on some kind of pseudo, like one of those, like overly self-love narcissistic types of things. Yeah. It's so a genuine confidence to go in and say, you know what? I'm going to take some losses out here in the world, but you know what? Those losses are going to lead me to a win. What I'm trying to prevent you from doing is throwing in the towel and just wanting to just accept your losses as permanent because failure is a part of winning. In fact, there is no winning without multiple failures. Yeah. Multiple attempts just don't work out. So I'm more than enough focuses on your image and focuses on accepting that the position you are in life, you created it, especially if you're over a certain age. You know, if you're nine years old, there's some things that happened in your life that you have no control over. However, once you cross over past high school, you need to start taking responsibility for where you are. And even if there is some things that went wrong and did not work out to your advantage, you still have to live with yourself. Yeah. It's like you can't blame mom and dad your whole life. Eventually, at some point, you have to say, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a physically and mentally capable adult to fix my problems. Because you know what? Shocker. We weren't all created equal. Once we came into the physical world, we were not all we were not all given equal gifts. No, we were not all given equal abilities. None of those things are equal. But you know what? There is a capacity for us to go out and get wins. We just have to figure out what that is and find a lane that's going to work for us. But it starts with idea of accepting it like, okay, maybe my life kind of was not that good coming up. Maybe my parents weren't the best they could be. You're 22 years old and here we are. What are you going to do now? You can sit there and blame dad and mom all you want, but your life is in your hands going forward. So what are you going to do? And then, of course, the final part of that is making the necessary changes that need to happen. For one, getting out of this idiot mindset that you're in that thinks it like somebody owes you something. That's number one. You know, wipe your tears off, wipe the wounds off, and let's get back in the game. Yeah. Let's limp, let's limp through this life until we can get our leg fixed and get back on the horse and let's get moving. Definitely, and definitely. Yes, there's seasons when life is rough and it's not going to be awesome. And I, I, I think that we're seeking happiness so much that we don't understand how life truly works. Mm. There's going to be a season in life. I mean, you have a child. But how do you know what's, how do you know whether you're happy or not? If you don't experience the pain and sorrow and sadness, because if you're just happy all the time, how do you know it's actually happiness? Well, we know there can't be happiness all the time because that just That's doesn't just not- yeah, it's that's just like, well, we have lessons to learn, basically, don't we? There's a journey that yes. we need to follow, and we have lessons to learn, and we just have to follow those lessons. And we need it. We need that. We we yeah. need we need the pain. We need the pain. Nature teaches us that. You know, you you bore a child. That's a process. It wasn't instant. You didn't. You know, you didn't Definitely be like, oh, pregnant, and then three, and then two weeks later, here comes a kid. No, you, there was a process. Your child grew inside of you. There were things you had to do. There were developments that was going on with him. Then boom, all that time. And then boom, it's showtime for you. Oh, giving, giving. It definitely giving, is. The, the, it the, definitely the, was. The, 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 the moment, like, okay. There are times I wish I could have put him these, back in there to grow oh, again. No, he doesn't need to go back in. Just, no, but you, you, went through the, you went through the nine months. There was a struggle that went through that. And then the final game time moment, it's like when you see a young boy or a young girl come into life, I don't know anyone who says that that wasn't worth it. Oh, no, anyone it's definitely did. worth it. It's definitely and, and worth it. But well, it has its challenges, it. like life. But that's, that's the thing. All that buildup, all that buildup, nine months then boom, showtime at the end, and then boom, here's life. Here's new life. Yeah. That, like you said, that's nature, that's life, that's reproduction. That is, that's the metaphor for life. Yeah, right there. No, definitely. It, the pain is needed and it's beautiful. 
So, Aman, it, look, it's been great talking to you. I love what you're saying. Um, how do people get in contact with you? How do they get to find your books? How do they find you? Uh, AmanVital.com is going to be the hub. And also, it's Amad Vital on all the social media platforms. That's uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, X, um, all of those different oh, yeah. things. But AmanVital.com is the hub is the hub for everything. And my, uh, my newest book is available on on 33 different digital platforms. Choose whichever oh one is your God. favorite. Oh my God. Yes. Yes. And I think, I think my publisher has a printing press, I think in Australia too. So maybe, just maybe I can convince them to like, Hey, do I need to go down and check on the press? Yeah, you Australia. need to go do a few little motivational talks and have a word. No, that's I'm good. Ready. That's good. So look, last question for you. Last question. What piece of advice have you been given that you still use today? Uh, what my father told me, um, live the best life you can, then give it all away. Wow. Live okay. the best life you can, then give it all away. Uh, life is not meant to be lived alone. Life is meant to be in community. Get out of your rabbit hole, your silo, your secondary bedroom. Get out, get you some vitamin D, meet with people, connect with people, love people, hug people, pray with one another, and get you a, get you a crew, get you a community of people around you who can love on you who can hug yeah. you, who can pick you up when times are down, uh, who can celebrate with you. Um, it's time for us to get back to what made us what we are, which is community, which is building, yeah. which is serving one another and loving one another. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome words. That's awesome final words, buddy. Um, look, thank you for coming and spending time with us today. Um, it's been great talking to you. It was great listening to you. You, you speak with such passion and such um, positivity. So, look, thank you for injecting that into this little old podcast. Um, and hopefully we'll touch base again when book number three comes out. I, well, you're not writing book number three, I must admit, just to say that so people don't. Uh, but, spoiler, book, book oh. number three is already out. We're working on book number four now. Oh, my God. Okay. Well, that's awesome. What's book number three called? Uh, now what? Five Steps to Get Up and Create the Most of Life. Um, oh my it is God. on all social media okay. platforms. You can actually offer it to your uh, to your audience. Booknowwhat.com. Booknowwhat.com. They can get a free digital copy. Uh, oh my, my publisher God. Made that page, so, so they can go get in on that. So why yes. booknow.com. Booknow.com. Book, book, book now what? Oh, book now, now what? As in W O T or W H A T? What? W H A T. What? Okay. Like, just check in, just like check in. There's two ways to spell it now, apparently. Um, all good, all good. Look, so look, thank you again for coming on here. Um, yeah, come on, get book number four out and we'll get you back on. <laughs> Definitely. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast or for links, resources and show notes, go to our website www.strongsingleandhuman.com We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin, and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast.